let's get started for the next session yeah welcome everyone and uh, for the op operating at this scale track uh, i welcome you on behalf of red hat to the devcon conference yeah and we are here for the next session which is over the blockchain enabled decentralized storage cluster which would be taken over by project over here which uh, so let's get started over the session Hey everyone, uh, welcome to my presentation. Uh, my name is Prasid Keshav Prasad and I work as an associate software engineer at Red Hat. Uh, I joined Red Hat one year back and I joined as an intern. I got converted uh, to full-time employee around uh, February of this year. So to talk a bit about myself, uh, I love to code, I love to automate and I love creating different kinds of applications and I do a lot of projects. Uh, Non-technically speaking, I watch a lot of films, uh, I love to travel, and I read quite a few books, and yeah. So before I start my presentation, I'd like to take a moment uh, to thank the organizers of this event, because it wouldn't have been easy, uh, you know, given the current situations that our world is facing. So I'd like to thank them, and yeah, so let's start. Presentation. So today the topic is topic on which I'm going to talk about is blockchain enabled decentralized storage cluster. So I believe that uh, the subtitle which I've added there uh, has caught your attention. So uh, basically what I'm trying to say is, you know, just to quote it again, what if I say the most secure way to keep your code is to keep it in a place where it's accessible for everyone. The main intention behind that quote was to subtly hint you know, about the psychology behind all such systems, that is accountability and prevention. But let's say that, uh, you know, you're keeping your gold, you know, apart from a vault, you have decided that you keep a, keep your gold in front of everyone. You know, let's say that in a public place and then you decide, okay, you keep it in the middle of the, middle of a public place as a statue of some kind. And so what are the preventions that you take? You add cameras and then, you know, you think of, different kinds of systems uh, which you know enables or which keeps your code securely so that's basically uh, you know in a vague way i could say that that's basically what decentralized storage is or you know decentralized system is so yeah i'm moving on so in today's agenda we'll be discussing about first primarily we'll be discussing the difference between centralized decentralized and distributed and then I'll be talking a bit about what decentralized storage is, that is what the scope of this current, uh, you know, uh, talk is. And then uh, why do we need this? And then I'll be moving on to talk a bit about the methodology. And then we'll be ending it with the future scope. So before I start, I'd like to say that storage, you know, was one of the inspirations. But uh, when I started this, uh, storage was like, uh, has a pretty good white paper in which they have, uh, you know, mentioned their own way of implementation. So, Storage is basically a decentralized storage application uh, a company that's a startup uh, and it's an open source uh, company. So, their code is in GitHub. Although their white paper is like very interesting, you know, they have different takes and different kinds of implementation uh, that helps them with other complexities. So, yeah. And the other tech industries uh, which follow decentralized storage is I, IFPS is not necessarily a decentralized storage, but uh, I think given that it IPFS is sorry IPFS is a file system, then I, I you know uh, we could consider that as well. And yeah, and I believe uh, uh, there was a company called Sia, uh, but I don't I'm, I'm not much familiar with it. But yeah, so moving on. So basically. There are three types, uh, may, uh, you know, major types of distributed systems. So first is centralized systems. So centralized systems are basically uh, a system with a client-server architecture. You know, basically like you request a data and the server, you know, you request a data and the client goes 
with your request and gets your answer and that is the response and you know from the server and then client gives it back to you so maybe like uh, i'd say that imagine an application where you request some kind of data from that server and then server goes i'm sorry or from the client and that client goes and fetches the data from the server let's say you know maybe um, I'm not sure if Wikipedia is a good example here, but you know, maybe I could say Wikipedia, you know, you're requesting the data from one of the Wikipedia clients and the client goes and fetches from the direct server and then it gives you the response. So that's centralized system. And the next is I'll explain this distributed and then come back to decentralized. And so the next is a distributed and distributed is very, uh, very popular kind of system you know it's like a system in which the final behavior of the system is you know it's it's basically uh, there is no single entity that receives and response to the request it's it's basically um google or uh, google search system could actually be a very good example here and each request is worked upon hundreds of different systems and which for you know goes and fetches the data and then returns back with the response so I would say this is written with a lot of nodes, but with one master kind of thing. Uh, it's basically multiple computers working together to accomplish one single task and it turns the result to the search query. And this is distributed. Uh, moving on to the decentralized system. This, is, this has become popular very recently with the massive hype of Bitcoin and blockchain. Uh, and I believe that a lot of current organizations are, you know, finding different different applications that they could use decentralized systems with. So basically, in decentralized system, every node makes its own decision, uh, and the final behavior of a system is the aggregate response of each node. So there is no master and slave. There are, you know, everyone is an equal has equal rights. So yeah, so let's say that if there needs to be a decision taken, it's it's a collective response. So it's truly a democratic way. So this is decentralized systems. So these are the three major systems which I want to discuss here because you know there has always been confusion confusion between decentralized and distributed. So as, even you know, myself, you know, okay, when I was in college, you know, I even I I kind of pondered upon what's the actual difference between decentralized and distributed because. Uh, not every distributor system is decentralized. So what is decentralized storage? So here, you know, the scope of this title, uh, this slide is to give you an overall understanding of how, you know, how a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer storage network works in an overall way. Uh, can you note that I'm, this is from my perception, uh, you know, and uh, a lot of companies could alter it and uh, you know they could have their own strategy but i believe like overall this is the way almost all the display storage systems are going forward so let's say that you know uh, myself i'm having a data in my hand let's say that i have a, a photo or a video or a text whatever and uh, Let's say there is a decentralized system with 10 nodes, including me. So that's nine other nodes and one mine. So in a decentralized system of 10 nodes and I'm connected in it, and I decide that, okay, I need to, you know, send this data to the cloud. And so I, you know, I, I take the photo and I upload it in a web UI or in a folder, no matter. And then what happens is it gets encrypted, right? And then uh, it gets, sharded or erasure coded and then sharded uh, and then it is distributed among the other nodes so uh, the distributions can happen at any way uh, so basically i'd be having a distributed hash table from my node and there are different algorithms like getting there so basically it will you know it would take a uh, basically you know, with the ability of the data and you know what are the other variables uh, it will make a decision on which would be the appropriate node or a computer that is good suitable for this particular data. Uh, basically, after all this, it will go and you know, in the end of the day, it will decide in one of the nodes. So, 
let's say that my document and I decide to upload it and I upload it, I uploaded it and it gets sharded, encrypted, sharded and it's now in four parts and it gets stored into random computers in the network. So now if I wanna, you know, if the, so it provides a secure, secure way, you know, because the other nodes, when they, you know, when they see that there's some file downloaded, they, they wouldn't be able to actually go and read it because they just have a tiny chunk of a data that to its encrypted. So they wouldn't really, uh, they won't be able to do anything with it. And they they can't even, you know, uh, decode, erase a decode or anything because they wouldn't be having access to that uh, particular data. So they pretty much wouldn't be able to, you know, alter it or do any type of attack in order to fetch the other files with, which shares the which shares the same checksum. So that's not possible. So this is how the other, you know, storage data is uploaded. And now when I want to download the data, I simply, you know, initiate a download request and it goes, uh, it has a hashing table of where all the nodes or, uh, you know, all the data are stored in these nodes. So it will basically go and fetch it and then re restructure it, you know, and then gets me back my file. So this is basically an overall architecture on how decentralized storage works. So I'll be explaining each part of it, you know, uh, let's say like, uh, if you go on to the other methodologies, I'll be moving on in the other slides, I'll be explaining on how each part can be implemented, like encryption and then sharding, you know, and then peer-to-peer -peer network, et cetera. So moving on. Uh, and yeah, why do we need this? So apart from the usual, you know, uh, the dialogues and the articles and the other things that you might have heard about, about privacy and the other things, I'd be focusing mainly on the other points here because obviously those points are already, you know, um, though obviously those are better ways on why we need an entire, you know, or an actual democratic system. Uh, but apart from that, I'd say that there is a minimal number of bomb performance bottlenecks occurring because it's like a big chunk of task, you know, that's evenly loaded. So there's no, there's no really a place for having bottleneck issues. And it's high available, high, you know, high availability is an assurance because let's say that if I'm a working guy and with the rate of how everyone, almost everyone has internet, you know, some nodes are like online 24 seven, right? So that's, and also let's say that if I'm uh, having with this, you know, in, in current situation, let's say that if I'm, a, I'm in a company or if I'm startup and which I have, uh, you know, uh, let's say that I'm in a situation where I need to be online 24 seven, but I'm having free disks that I'm not using, then this could be a way, you know, I could simply connect to this, into the network and then I'd be getting money or the other things. So, so yeah, so it's high availability and assurance because almost everyone, like I just said, is might be online 24 seven and more autonomy and over, you know, control over resources because as each node controls its own behavior, it has better autonomy leading to more control over resources. So that's another point. And yeah, coming to, <laughs> data or okay, levels of data again, you know, uh, this, obviously this presentation wouldn't be complete without referencing this hit series, uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Silicon Valley is a hit series that, uh, you know, that kind of shares the same idea of a decentralized storage. So yeah, so <laughs> I, uh, that's a simple image from, from the series. So data get in, uh, well, yeah, data get in, but data get in what, means is basically running out of, you know, reaching a point where data cannot be stored, you know, all the other companies, they could uh, eventually get into a point where data is, you know, no more could it be accumulated. But I believe like uh, we are still years from it. Uh, obviously that could be a, you know, possibility of that happening, but I believe like that's uh, not going to happen anytime soon, but and the other point is like costs of data overhead would always be a problem, you know, because uh, let's say that if I want to create a simple application or uh, or anything, uh, then I'd be you know forced to rely upon other third party 
paid services for them to host my data or my service or my product or whatever. So that's definitely a big concern because with the costs of raising the air, you know, costs of uh, the data increasing or their services increasing, that's definitely a problem. Especially if, you know, the point one of data apocalypse, if that's bound to happen, then obviously the cost of data could also, you know, also be increased. Uh, but yeah, so uh, even though if, uh, even though if it's not actually increased, I'd still be, you know, if it, if such a system comes into an existence, I'm sorry, such a system exists, but if this becomes very popular, then I'd say that people would much more prefer to host their systems free uh, or without, or at least without, you know, uh, giving them such big money. So Web 3.0, that actually could be a real thing. It is, you know, because uh, I believe like Web 3.0 kind of executes the mission and vision that was set by the of the actual internet when it was actually created. So that could, you know, that's actually a very good, you know, once very good reason why we need a decentralized storage because once Web 3, Web 3.0, a completely decentralized internet is, you know, if, if that's possible and if that's achieved, then I believe like this decentralized storage or uh, pretty much any applications in a decentralized system could benefit us in the long term and a long way. So, methodologies. So here uh, I'm going to be explaining each part or each entity uh, like I mentioned about in the previous slides. So for example, I'll be explaining in a continuous way or in a, so that it's easy to be, it's easy to follow. For example, let's say that I'm now uploading a file. So the first point is file encryption and then erasure coding, the peer-to-peer. -peer. So I'll be explaining it, explaining it in the same order. So there are five points here, but uh, in in the middle, I'd be explaining a few concepts from blockchain, just so that we can compare, or not just compare, just so that we'd understand the system even more. So the first is file encryption. So the moment we hear encryption, I believe that for some of you, you know, you obviously might have thought of shard to six. So I'd be talking a bit about how shard to six can actually be a big advantage for decentralized systems, you know, because uh, it's let's say that it shares the same vision on how on the same, you know, it, it basically benefits the vision that is being put forth by decentralized systems and their consensus protocols. So uh, let's say that for every, you know, it's it's known that every human in the world has the same DNA uh, in their fingerprint. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, has different unique DNA uh, and a unique fingerprint. And yeah, so unique fingerprint. So it's so it's like if something, you know, if a person is involved in some kind of criminal activities or whatnot or the other things, then they could find out like what who this person is. So obviously fingerprint helps them in finding out with the, who the person is and whatnot. So similarly, a SHA-256 shares the same vision. So SHA-256 is basically a unique fingerprint for each type and each document. So let's say that I have a JPEG or whatever file and I do a SHA-256 encoding of it, I'd be getting a 64 hexadigit value of it, you know, uh, a unique identifier for that particular document. So, to talk a bit about SHA-256, it's basically an algorithm which allows us to generate a hash value, and it's a number, but it's represented in hexadecimal way, and it's created by the uh, National Security Agency of the United States. So, yeah, so to continue talking about SHA. So it's like, it's basically an algorithm and it's really powerful. And I believe the code of the algorithm is not really a secret anymore because I think the, uh, you know, the code, source code is available online. So maybe you could uh, look into it and try to understand how it works. So SHA stands for Secure Hashing Algorithm. And the important thing here is that this algorithm works for any types of document and uh, no matter what type the document is. So, uh, as an input, you'd be basically giving a, doc a document and an answer output. 
it would basically give you a hash value. And not just the type, right? Uh, not just the type, it basically gives you, even if you give around 10 KB of a file or one GB of a file, it's going to produce the same 64 hexadecimal value of the hash. And, and that's pretty a great thing. And yeah, so, and no matter the input, the hash is always 64, like I said. And that's like first advantage of a decentralized system or vision. So yeah, so also it, it's, uh, it, does, it doesn't not, uh, and not just the, you know, type of the document, it basically, you know, no matter what I, what the size of the document that you give us an input, you know, let's say that you give it 10 KB of a file or one GB of a file, and it's just going to produce the same, six, you know, it's just going to produce a 64 hexadecimal character hash value. And uh, yeah, and this pretty much, you know, no, this kind of no matter the input, uh, the hash is only 64 hexadecimal character. This kind of thing is a big advantage for any decentralized system because it's uh, crypt cryptographically it satisfies the first rule, not the first rule, you know, it satisfies the uh, one of the rules of decentralized system. Uh, and the another important point is it's pretty deterministic, you know, uh, it's like, let's say that I give a file with a content and I, you know, I get a hash. And if I manage to replicate the document and put in the same input, I'd be getting the same hash. So it's pretty straightforward. And the other thing is it's unpredictable, right? Let's say that I give a hello world and I try to hash it and I'm getting a 64 uh, character, 64 set of decimal character hash. And I just make even a teeny tiny bit change of adding a dot here or there. I'd be getting an entirely different hash, so it's pretty. Uh, you know, I won't be able to brute force by plus or minus or anything. Uh, it's pretty much fast computation for mining, so it doesn't take a lot of time, and you, you know, if you just in a snap of a second, you're probably getting you're getting the hash value, and it withstands the so so it basically withstands the collision, meaning that uh, this gives us, you know, uh, the deterministic or uh, the one way, no way to get the details of the files based on the hash gives us, a, gives, an, gives us an advantage, you know, because it can withstand collision. So we can probably uh, use it and restructure it, not the code, you know, we can probably use the hash 65 and, you know, implement a system where you pretty much can't, uh, you know, recreate a file. We're basically by encrypting it further of salt SALT mechanisms. So basically this is what SHA is. And the next, coming to next of sharding, uh, it's erasure coding. So basically what erasure coding is, is, uh, you know, it's uh, in a simple way, uh, it's basically a way in which, uh, you know, if your file is split into three and you lost, you, you know, you lost around one file, you'll still be able to get all the contents of the other file with just one or two nodes. So it's basically how uh, we decode it or encode it in the first place. So that's erasure encoding. So there are different types of erasure encoding, uh, different types of algorithms that use erasure encoding, but I'd like to uh, simply give you an example so that uh, you can understand how erasure encoding works. So here you can see an example, like, uh, you know, uh, let's say that you take a si file of size 200 MB, then you split it into two chunks, and each of them has the same size. That is, you split a 200 MB file into two, so you get 100 MB file each. So now you're basically applying a function of N of K on these K chunks to get N chunks. So basically, let's say that if you need four chunks, then you probably be getting 400 MB file. So the file just gets expanded the twice the initial size. So it was 200 MB, but the moment you apply the function, it's now 400 MB. I, I'll, I'll be explaining why it's 400 MB right now. Uh, and now the effective way is, uh, like I just said, it just expanded into two times. And now if you, you know, with just one chunk of the data, you'll be able to get all the other uh, data. So let's say that you split, there's a file, it's in, you know, a file of 10 MP, and if I'm applying four into two function, that actually can be changed. And 
uh, it's split across the node. I just need one chunk of a file to recreate the other. And uh, I, I believe like that's pretty cool, even though uh, the file size is increasing twice, it still be giving us the um, security that we need. Uh, so, you know, even getting into it a bit more, I'd say that let's say a file A here is getting split into two, and now it's getting encoded, and now we have four chunks of the data, right? So let's take an example here. So, so this is A1, right? A1 chunk of file will be actually having one part of the file. A2 will be having the other part. A3 and A4 would be having some equations by which if we get at least one part of the file, we could probably compute it and get the values of the other two and thus getting get the actual, you know, actual, uh, thus we'd be getting the actual data. So uh, let's take a, a small example. So here, consider that the original value of the object or the data is 95, right? Uh, so here, what we're gonna do is we're dividing the 95 in such a way that X equals nine and Y equals five. And the encoding process will create a series of equations. So the equations could be X plus Y and then X minus Y, two X plus Y or X plus two Y, whatever, right? And all these number of equations would be based upon the input that you give. So if it's four, then it's gonna operate in such a way. So, so it's basically that. So here, once all these equations is, you know, calculated, and then you split it across the node, and then you are only able to get, you know, two. Let's say that you are able to get x plus five equal to fourteen and x minus four equal to x minus y equal to four. Then you pretty much will be able to calculate the, you know, the values of x and y with just that. So you wouldn't be requiring two x plus y, or anything. So you can basically recreate your data from your part and then be done with it. So this, in a nutshell, is what erasure encoding is. I believe there are like lots of erasure algorithms that you could just look up to and see how that works. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. So we saw uh, initially, you know, going uh, through the you know process. I have seen how my file, you know, when I upload a file, I have seen like how uh, the file gets encrypted, and now I've seen how the file gets sharded. Now, uh, I know, let's uh, try to, under even though this is, you know, a common subject, let's try to understand how peer-to-peer -peer works. So, <clears throat> obviously, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network, the peers are like the computer systems which are connected to each other uh, via the internet. Uh, files can actually be shared directly between the systems and uh, without the need for a central server. So, in the other words, each computer on a peer-to-peer -peer network becomes the server as well as the client. Uh, the only requirement uh, to join a P2P network, uh, I believe, is like a stable internet connection. And I don't inter by internet, I don't mean the World Wide Web because you, let's say that you uh, you want to create just one mesh connection in your area, you could pretty much do that as well. You know, you wouldn't really need an internet with that. But yeah, I, I believe that's what internet is called for. And then some P2P software. So uh, to name a few common P2P software, I'd say. Bear, Share, Morpheus, Accusation, etc. And yeah, so once connected to the network, uh, P2P software allows you to share files, you know, download them and send them, whatever, uh, similar to that. And meanwhile, you know, the other users on the network can search for the files on your computer. Uh, so the restrictions can be imposed by you, you know, uh, maybe uh, I believe like you, you can create one volume group on one disk or a folder through which the other, other person can would only be having access to that and not the entire system. So pretty much it would be in a, your, your computer would be compromised. So this is what peer-to-peer -peer network is. And so now let's get into what blockchain is. I'm not going to go in deep with the complete operations of blockchain, but I'd like to cover uh, an overall, overall educative, uh, a quick dive. So basically blockchain is blocks, you know, of chain, and it's like a growing list of records, and each block is cryptographically linked together. So here you can see, uh, you know, three blocks, one, two, three, which are cryptographically linked together, and in the top left, you can see, I'm sorry, in the top right, you can see a data or sample block. So basically, you know, uh, 
let's say that a blockchain would basically be containing uh, five fields. Uh, first one is the block name, and that probably isn't it's, it's out outstanding now because indexing is now irrelevant because it's you know pretty much we'd be knowing it uh, through counters or anything. So I think it's been replaced with uh, timestamps and whatnot. But just for the sake of it, uh, we can include it in our blockchain or our example. So the first one is the block number or the block. The next one is the nonce value. I'll, I'll be explaining what nonce in just a second. And the other thing is the actual data. And then the previous hash and then hash. So previous hash is basically the hash of the previous block. So this is how the blocks are interlinked together, right? So the first ha first hash, uh, you know, well, let's say the A, a, B, and C. So B in the B block uh, would probably be having the previous hash of the A block. And the current hash is computed by taking in the previous hash and the other things, nuns, block number, and the data. So it's pretty much tightly linked together. Uh, and so you must have wondered, or uh, you must have noticed that the first block would, you know, obviously would be having a previous one because it's first and it should start from somewhere. So the first block is called as the genesis block uh, because it doesn't have any previous uh, hashes. So yeah, so this is in in a nutshell, this is what a blockchain is. And yeah, uh, let's move on. So. An immutable ledger, uh, I'd say that, let's again go into an example of what this immutable ledger is. So by immutable ledger, blockchain claims that uh, no data can be altered or no one can mess with the data or no one can you know, uh, restructure it, hack, whatever. It claims that it's unhackable or stuff like that. So let's see how that actually is achieved. So let's say that in a, Let's take an example of, uh, you know, a naive example with the central server. So let's say that I, I'm planning to buy a car, right? So I go into the showroom, I pay them, and I get, you know, get the car, and I go with the documents to a government, just so that I can in this example, and then I tell them that okay, I paid this much, and now this particular car, this number plate is mine, and so that guy who takes down has taken. The note that okay you have paid this much and then you have you know bought a car uh, of so and so record and he has created a neatly structured record and he is putting it in his DB. So now you own the car. But what if that person who writes a record has made a mistake or you know since no one is there to verify what he has done, let's say that he has intentionally or unintentionally has made a mistake and then he when he put it in his system he it exposed a threat or a vulnerability, which later on somehow, let's say that uh, eventually, uh, it's let's say that uh, he messed up the name, right? And now, technically speaking, I don't own that car. Someone else does. So that's vulnerability. So that's like okay. Now technically, that's uh, uh, yeah, that's that's that cannot be ha happening because uh, there goes our security and everything. Because technically now I don't have uh, the car, so now I'll have to go and register a complaint and whatnot. So now let's see the same exact example if we implement it in blockchain. Let's see how that's going to operate. So, yeah. So in a ledger of a blockchain, uh, the moment I buy a car, let's say uh, through some smart contracts. So smart contracts. Uh, I'm not going to go and talk about what smart contracts is, but it's basically let's. Uh, say that okay, that's some kind of an automated record without uh, no human intervention help. So the moment I buy a car, uh, it's been registered, and now you know. Let's say that in a okay, I'll explain it with an example. So there are ten nodes. So I go uh, in in the network and I go. I buy a car. The moment I buy a car and I pay them, uh, a neatly structured timestamp to take data is now you know. Is now registered in that one node. So, whichever place which I buy, you know, which I have uh, bought the car from, uh, think of it as uh, think of that as one of the nodes in the network. And the moment I buy a car from them, that uh, particular node has now released a, a node, a data, and stating that 
okay, so and so person has bought so and so car. So now this travels across the block, right? So it is verified and I will just see how mining works. So mining is a process of verification of whether this is actually the uh, oh, very, uh, good data and it's not some other kind of thing. So eventually once everything is uh, in place, all the nodes agrees that this is good data and they add it in their own uh, copy of data. So here, uh, let's say that somehow the guy uh, finds a way, the attacker finds a way and changes uh, the node, right? Changes the node in one of the system. So now what happens is if that no, uh, that change, if it has to be, uh, you know, aggregated across this network, then he probably have to, you know, since it's cryptographically linked, he probably have to change the entire block in that particular and that chain of blocks in the particular node, you know, because once the moment he changes something here, something there, uh, that means that the entire block afterwards is now null. Yeah, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. That's garbage data. So that sends out, you know, an alert. So that alert part and all is how basically how we implement our system. So I like to think of it as an alert. And then, you know, once that is done, uh, let's say that if that's, uh, you know, if that change, once that change is triggers and uh, some kind of notifications or an alert, uh, it basically would uh, let the other nodes know, okay, that node is corrupted, you know, because it's cryptographically changed. Now, let's say that he has uh, managed to entirely change the data or entirely change the block, uh, making, you know, he mines each block or he has somehow maliciously figure out, figured out a way, which is super hard, by the way, and he has completely, you know, replaced an entire chain of blocks in one of the node. But he still, he has just managed to change one of, you know, the entire block in one of the nodes. So it still hasn't been agreed upon by the 90 percentage of the blocks because they have another, you know, they have their copies is different. So, you know, all such systems uh, build up the security so that uh, people can't actually mess up with it. So this is one of the example which I'd like to say on why blockchain is called or uh, known as an immutable ledger. So like take on mining here. Uh, so here, what they have done is, uh, I mean, what here, let's say the same, let's take the same example of the block. Here I'm having a block number, I'm having a nonce value, data, previous session hash. So I said that I'll be explaining nonce later on. So this is the time in which I'm I'm going to be explaining it. So basically, uh, the hash and the previous hash I have explained, and data itself is pretty, pretty self-explanatory. So in mining, right? Uh, mining is basically uh, mining is basically by figure out figuring out a brute force way that gives us a desired hash, right? So let's say that. Mm, I need to I need to be able to generate a hash value for this particular block that satisfies some condition, and I I'd be only be you know I'd be able to change the hash only if I mess with the block or the contents of the block. So I won't be able to mess with the contents of the data because that's wrong and that's that's going to create a lot of problems. So that's not going to happen. So I but I need to be able to change something that gives me some hash, right? So that's where nuns come in. So nuns is basically some number uh, that's changeable. So if I change, let's say, let's say that uh, nuns is 306 and that particular hash of that block is composed or is it's implemented with uh, that ha uh, with that nuns, the moment I change the nuns by adding one or decreasing whatever, the entire hash is going to change of that block is going to change. So this is how we use nuns to mine. So uh, let's see an example here. So here, let's say that the goal of this particular mining is to, uh, is that, uh, so once I create a data, I'd be saying that, okay, now uh, the target value of the end hash is, starts with four or five zeros, right? So now I'd be able, I, I'd have to brute force uh, by inputting nuns, you know, or changing the nuns uh, until I find out a hash which starts with five zeros. 
So with five zeros, uh, hexadecimally speaking, that means that it's probably the in the lowest area. So imagine a graph, if you will, of that kind where largest goes up and smallest is down. And uh, let's say that the target is in the smallest. So I'd have to create, you know, I'd have to input lots of different kinds and way of nuns in it. Uh, because uh, and to find out, okay, is it small or is it uh, is it am I in a target or has uh, have I been you know have I been able to produce a hash with six zeros that is the target. So until and unless I find out, uh, I'd still be mining. So this is essentially what mining is. And once I find out that okay, uh, I've been able to put force a value, I'd be able to get uh, you know I'd be rewarded with the uh, coins or whatever. So. This is essentially what mining is. And also no one can actually, you know, uh, because like I said, because of the hashes, uh, you know, uh, hashes, Shadow uh, six feature, we probably can't brute force this, right? Because let's say the 300 gives you a hash with four zeros. That doesn't mean that 301 is going to give you the next value of the hash because it's it can entirely be different. So that is a, good way on the so that's why i said like okay hash two to six algorithms features is in a good way you know it satisfies the conditions of a decentralized system so this is why that point and i had said that point earlier so this is what mining is so uh mining and the bitcoin part the reason which i've told you is for to you know to bring uh or to shed light upon the verification mechanism in a decentralized storage, you know, because now we have seen it in a transaction state, but now we need to be able to figure out a way uh, to, you know, to manage whether our data is still there and whether our data is corrupted or not. So we need to be able to create a system uh, where such verifications can be done. So before I again explain that, I'd like to talk a bit about Merkle tree. So all that proof of storage, and I believe some mining processes are still using, I mean, not still, are being used by Merkle tree. I'd like to explain what a Merkle tree is. So in cryptography, right, uh, a hash tree or a Merkle tree is basically in which every leaf node is, you know, is labeled with a cryptographic hash of a data block. And every non-leaf node is a cryptographic hash table of their child nodes. So let's say that in this example, you can see there are four data blocks, L1, L2, L3, and L4. And those, uh, and if you see the first leaf node, it's basically a cryptographic hash of data block L1. So hash 00, that is the leaf node, is basically a cryptographic hash of data block L1. Similarly, hash 01 is cryptographic hash of data block L2. Hash 10, L3, and hash 11 is a cryptographic hash of data of L4, right? So now, once I have been able to compute the hashes of data block, all the other, you know, since I've covered the leaf nodes, the non-leaf non -leaf nodes, what, what they do is they compute the hashes of their child nodes. So hash zero is basically the, uh, you know, cryptographic hash of hash zero zero and hash zero one, and hash one is basically a cryptographic hash of hash one zero and hash one one. And it, it would go again and again recursively until it reaches one hash where it, you know, it covers the, again the hashes of the its child and we get an actual hash, master hash or root hash, if you will. So this is what uh, Merkle tree is. Uh, so coming back into proof of storage. So um, before I tell you how Merkle tree is being used in proof of storage, I'd like to add that. It's up to us, right? Once we figure out the basic implementation or basic necessities of how we need to create a decentralized system, it's entirely up to us on how to create it and how to implement it. So let's say that if I want to uh, go on in a naive approach, then I could probably implement a listener or some kind of thing or an audit track where it goes uh, around the peer-to-peer post-response -peer kind of type of thing, you know, to check whether the data still exists here and there across the network. So every client could initialize such a thing. Uh, but obviously this would have a lot of overhead, unnecessary overhead. But I'm just, you know, I just uh, wanted to say that as an example because uh, it's entirely up to you. So if you're able to develop a very good algorithm that doesn't necessarily uh, beats it or necessarily, that doesn't necessarily 
uh, follows the architecture but still works for you, then you can, of course, proceed with that. So speaking of, uh, you know, that I'd like to uh, explain how the proof of storage has been implemented in uh, storage, right? Storage basically has an alternative way. It, it has two ways, but uh, this is an alternative way of how they verify whether a particular node has a data with them. So the alternate methods is basically uh, it. So so this so what it does is it basically presents a hash challenge, uh, and that hash challenge has to be solved or it, ha it has to be you know uh, fulfilled in order to accept okay that data is pretty is pretty much there, and it shouldn't take a lot of my uh, time because this is not uh, this is this is something you know without any brute force approach or anything. This is not mining completely. This is like a verification method, right? So coming into the actual application of how they have implemented, uh, let's say that, uh, so if you see here in this tree, there is, they have created, uh, you know, you can, if you can see a root seed there, that's basically client creating a series of seeds deterministically from the root seed, right? So what is seed? Seeds are pretty much basically uh, data that you upload once you download. So let's say that uh, you download a file from the peer to peer network. The moment it's downloaded, you start uploading it. So that's called a seeding. And the opposite of seeding is leaching. Uh, that's when you keep downloading, but you don't upload. So that's actually a threat to a decentralized system. Uh, but that's what uh, seeding and uh, leaching means. So coming back uh, here, the client has created a root seed, right? And then he has created a series of seeds from the root seed. And what it does is, what the series of root it does is, it, after it, uh, after such, uh, you know, create, after it creates a series of seeds, uh, it would be added to a file and it would be hashed to generate a unique hash answer. So once it's, uh, yeah, so we have a unique hash answer. So this, once this client generates the hash challenges, it builds a Merkle tree, like the one we just saw before, and it inserts the Merkle root into the blockchain. So, and then it publishes or gives the Merkle tree uh, minus the leaf nodes to the other nodes so that they can verify whether this particular node has, uh, you know, whether this particular node, because uh, since it won't be having the uh, leaf nodes, and when it, uh, uh, so, so, I'm sorry. So, so basically, it it would be giving once it's hashes and it's added to the blockchain, it would be giving this Merkle tree without the leaf nodes to the other uh, other uh, nodes with, who has my data, because once they accept it and once I'm sending in my seed, it can be matched, right? Because I'm I'll be they'll be having the Merkle root or Merkle tree without the leaf nodes, and I'll be having one of the seeds. So I can actually. Once it reaches their computer or their node, it, it, it can calculate. And once it calculation is succeeds, then that means that, okay, that particular node has my data. So this is, that's a pretty good, uh, I hope I, you know, that's, that's a pretty good way of uh, implementing a proof of storage mechanism with low overhead. Uh, I believe I've been able to explain it uh, properly. So again, yeah. Uh, you know, again, this is just their way of implementation. And if you have a better way, then you can as well. So this is concluding the proof of storage. Ultimately, you know, uh, this is a proof of storage. This is our last method because we have covered file, uploading of a file, and then sharding, and then we have covered peels of, you know, peel to peel. Then we uh, saw how, how strong the ledger is and how blockchain you know how has uh, you know how blockchain uh, basically has made the ledger strong, and then we all, we also saw we also saw the proof of storage, and and also we also saw the traditional mining. So concluding the proof of storage, uh, you know the steps of it is basically steps to upload and retrieve a file went from the network, right? So we split the file into pieces, add iteration coding, encrypt, generate charts, 
We transfer the shards to various nodes on the network based on the distribution and their ratio for each games. Uh, so the paying, right? This is where incentivizing comes in. So paying each nodes upon the completion of an audit, right? So this is basically uh, we need. So there won't be volunteers around the network in the real time who would be basically dedicating their risk to the network, you know, because there needs there need to be some motivation for the users or basically uh, for the users in the nodes to give their, you know, disks to the network. So that's when uh, incentivizing comes in. So talking about a business approach, if I am the one who's using the network and then if I'm the one who's basically you making use of the storage item, that's saying that I have a file that I'm loading it, then I probably be paying each node, whichever, uh, node has my chunk of data. And the client may contact any of the nodes for data retrieval, in which case the nodes pay for the transfer of the data also as well. So this in general, you know, we have concluded how the implementation part is. But to talk a bit about incentivizing, uh, this is very much required, right? Because this, I believe uh, I've seen, this is uh, economically speaking, this is the first time. I, I might be wrong yet, but you know that I've seen uh, a computer science problem be solved with the help of economy economics. So that's a good way, you know, uh, and that is very much required because then, if it's not incentivizing, we need to come up with some kind of application uh, that would make the user keen on connecting their disk to the network. So, but I, I believe like such applications are not yet there you know let's say that if you are a gamer or if there are some gaming systems then you obviously be inclined to be keeping it you know it's pay as you store uh, and once you go once you leave the network there should be an immediate file transfer to the existing nodes so that's pretty much a high value theory but that is possible you know because once i believe like once the entire network or once the uh, decentralized system has started uh, and you know it, once it's all not just the computer science students or the engineers uh, if it's like if it's reached a potential where even a normal consumers or customers are using it then i believe like such things can be possible you know without actually incentivizing you know if the application is so good and that people let's say that let's take an example of gaming if i'm if i'm like actual gamer and the moment I'm playing the games, I can probably uh, store the data there. And then the moment I exit, the data could be transferred or even narration for something of some sort like that. And basically, if I am introducing machine learning or anything, the uh, user statistics, uh, again, this is not in any way an innovation of the user data, uh, simply getting the values of uh, how much time the user is uh, using that particular key, uh, but again, if it is if it goes against the values of decentralized web, then I'm not suggesting that we do that. But I'm just simply saying that there can be other ways to incentivize uh, the customers uh, apart from money. So yeah, uh, concluding it, uh, I believe I've covered almost all the topics, and I strongly believe that once if we do this right, you know. Uh, the solutions could open up to a lot of other factors as well, uh, social media. I believe like there are lots of sample tests of social media in decentralized systems as well. But I, I really believe like it could revolutionize and it could create an actual democratic system in the internet. So you would actually be owning the data. So that's a pretty cool thing if you ask me. So yeah, thank you. I guess I'll be taking the questions now. Uh, hello, am I audible? Okay. Thanks uh, for listening to my session, uh, especially to such a long session uh, for those of you who have made it to the end. Uh, so is there any questions? Okay, apparently not, I think.
all right then uh, so please uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, you know i'd be happy to talk uh, even more about this or even uh, I'll let you know about uh, the beta projects that i'm working with respect to the decentralized systems yeah thanks a lot rajit for yeah. having this a long bit long conversation yeah. session yeah it went off quite long but yeah anyways it was quite interesting session and yeah thanks. people Thank enjoyed you. listening to you hopefully yeah yeah thanks a lot right. and yeah. good day. uh